Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Acts chapter 19, 21 through 41. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into dis repute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is... that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemous of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, there are pro councils Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. In 1799, the missionary, uh, the father of modern missions, William Carey, After observing uh, for the first time the uh, Indian sati, uh, the Hindu practice of burning uh, the living widow or widows uh, with her deceased husband, wrote this entry in his journal. As I was returning from Calcutta, I saw a number of people assembled on the riverside. I asked them what they meant for, and they told me to burn the body of a dead man. I inquired if his wife would die with him, and they answered yes, and pointed to the woman. She was standing by the pile, which was made up of large billets of wood, about two and a half feet high, four feet long, and two wide, on the top of which lay the dead body of her husband. Her nearest relation stood by her, and near her was a small basket of sweet meats called thoi. I asked them if this was the woman's choice, or if she were brought to it by any improper influence. 
They answered that it was perfectly voluntary. I talked till reasoning was of no use and then began to exclaim with all my might against what they were doing, telling them that it was a shocking murder. They told me it was a great act of holiness and added in a very surly manner that if I did not like to see it, I might go further off and desired me to go. I told them that I would not go and that I was determined to stay and see the murder and that I should certainly bear witness of it at the tribunal of God. I exhorted the woman not to throw away her life, to fear nothing, for no evil would follow her refusal to burn. But she, in the most calm manner, mounted the pile and danced on it with her hands extended, as if in the utmost tranquility of spirit. Previous to her mounting the pile, the relation whose office it was to set fire to the pile led her six times round it. As she went round, she scattered the sweet meats above mentioned among the people who picked it up and ate it as a very holy thing. This being ended, she lay down by the corpse and put one arm under its neck and the other over it, and with a quantity of dry cocoa leaves and other substances were heaped over them to a considerable height, and then ghee or melted preserved butter poured on the top. Two bamboos were then put over them and held fast down, and the fire put to the pile, which immediately blazed very fiercely owing to the dry and combustible materials of which it was composed. No sooner was the fire kindled, then all the people set up a great shout, hurry bowl, hurry bowl, which is a common shout of joy and an invocation of hurry, the wife of her or Seeb. It was impossible to have heard the woman had she groaned or even cried aloud on account of the mad noise of the people. And it was impossible for her to stir or struggle on account of the bamboos which were held down on her like the levers of a press. We made much objection to their using these bamboos and insisted that it was using force to prevent the woman from getting up when the fire burned her. But they declared that it was only done to keep the pile from falling down. We could not bear to see more, but left them, exclaiming loudly against the murder and full of horror at what we had seen. Within 30 years, Carrie's gospel ministry would lead to the abolition of Sati in India. It was inevitable that the gospel preached by Carrie would work itself out in the lives of new Christians in India. As a result, the gospel began to expand, increasingly permeating Indian society and eventually led to the end of the wicked Hindu practice of widow burning. In Acts 19, 21 to 41, we see that Paul's gospel ministry in Ephesus leads to an economic decline in the idol-making business. It is inevitable that the gospel preached by Paul would work itself out in the lives of new Christians in Ephesus. As a natural outcome, the gospel begins to expand, increasingly permeating Ephesian society, leading to a decline in the idol-making market. And we see, not only in this section, but really throughout the entire chapter of uh, chapter 19 of Acts, and thus far in the book, that the gospel turns the world upside down as King Jesus conquers his enemies. And I have one point this morning, uh, for those of you who are taking notes. Fairly straightforward passage. But the, the main point, main command I have for you this morning is this. Be the right kind of gospel troublemaker. Be the right kind of gospel troublemaker. Christians are going to cause trouble in the world. Jesus said that he came to divide. We want to cause that right kind of division. We want to be the right kind of gospel troublemakers. Acts 19 opens as Luke turns away from his introduction of the new preacher Apollos 
and returns his focus to the Apostle Paul. We saw this last week. Paul has made his circuitous journey from Antioch back through the churches that he planted in order to strengthen the saints there, and he's now returned to Ephesus. And we saw that when Paul returns to Ephesus, he encounters 12 men who were disciples of John the Baptist, who had experienced John's baptism of repentance. But unlike Apollos, these men were not Christians. They had not heard of a Holy Spirit. They certainly had not been baptized in the Spirit. Paul preaches the gospel of Christ to these men. There is a a Pentecost-like event where the Spirit falls down on these 12 men in a Gentile city. They speak in tongues and prophesy. They're baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. And Paul then turns and continues preaching in the Jewish synagogue in Ephesus for three months until there is resistance of such a kind that the unbelieving Jews are speaking evil of the way, speaking evil and slanderous of Christ. And so Paul turns away from the Jewish synagogue and then moves to the Gentile public arena, the Hall of Tyrannus, where he preaches daily for two years to Jew and Gentile who will listen to him. And preaching in this public setting, Paul would have been very well aware of the marketplace of Ephesus, preaching in the context of people going to and fro, to buy idols, to go to the temple. And these unbelieving Gentiles were hearing Paul's message of Christ crucified, and many of them were repenting and believing. We saw also that there's clear spiritual power in Paul's ministry. They would take handkerchiefs that, that touched Paul or aprons that touched Paul and then go and take it to a sick person or a demon-possessed person and, and they'd be healed or the demon would be exercised. And that doesn't go unnoticed by a culture that is obsessed with spiritual power, desiring to have power over diseases and demons. And the world is desirous of this kind of spiritual power, and we see seven sons of Sceva, these brothers, who were Jewish exorcists. They see, holy smokes, this guy Paul has got some tremendous power. We need to start invoking his name and the name of the Jesus that he proclaims. So these Jewish exorcist brothers attempt to channel the power of the Spirit through the use of Jesus' name in an exorcism, and the demon they they attempt to exorcise won't submit to unbelievers who simply want to use the name of Jesus as some kind of magical incantation or voodoo mama juju. That's not how it works. The demon professes to know of both Jesus and Paul, giving recognition to the spiritual authority of Jesus and Paul. And then says, but who are you? And then proceeds to exorcise those exorcists from the house, naked and beaten. The men run away naked and ashamed. This act confirms the power and validity of Christ's gospel that Paul proclaims. Because Paul doesn't run away from a demon-possessed person naked and beaten. Demons are exorcised in Jesus' name. But Jesus won't allow unbelievers to use his name as if he's some kind of genie. And so the Lord's judgment against the seven sons of Sceva bring really a holy fear upon the Christians in Ephesus. And as a result of that holy fear as is normally the case, when you have holy fear, that leads to greater holiness and a desire to be conformed more into the image of Christ. The Ephesian believers, saints, burn all of their magic books, all of which are quite costly, and the word of the Lord continues to advance in great power in the midst of this imperial city. King Jesus exerts his sovereign power over his enemies. No one can stop the advance of God's word as it's preached in 
more and more Gentile areas of the Roman Empire, but Christ's enemies aren't just demons. There are real enemies in this world, and sometimes the enemy can reveal itself as an ungodly, worldly mob. Which brings us to the first point into our text. Make the right kind of trouble for Jesus, or be the right kind of gospel troublemaker. The Spirit of God now moves in Paul to begin another journey. I've got to go to Rome. But before I go to Rome, I've got to go to Jerusalem. So he wants to set off through Macedonia and Achaia to Jerusalem and ultimately to Rome, the center of the empire. And uh, meanwhile, Paul takes two brothers, Timothy and Erastus, both of whom have aided him in gospel ministry in Ephesus and in Corinth, and he sends them ahead of him to Macedonia while he stays a little bit longer in the Asian city of Ephesus. Now, we've already met Timothy in Acts 16. At the end of Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas have a severe disagreement over John Mark. John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, a cousin of Barnabas, had abandoned them in the midst of one of their earlier missionary journeys. Paul doesn't want to take Mark anymore because he's like, I don't want to deal with quitters. It's going to get hard. Don't want Mark to quit on us again. Barnabas, son of encouragement, is like, no, we need to give him another chance. Plus, he's my cousin. And uh, we see in the midst of a sharp disagreement that uh, Paul and Barnabas can't agree. And so they separate. Paul goes to Lystra where he picks up Timothy. That's where we see Timothy in Acts 16 for the first time. Timothy's the son of a Jewish believing woman, Eunice, and an unbelieving Greek man. We never know his father's name. Timothy had trusted in Christ just as his grandmother Lois and mother Eunice had before him. We see in 2 Timothy 1. Paul has Timothy circumcised not in order to keep the Old Covenant, but in order that they might more effectively minister to the Jews and Gentiles both in the cities in which they'll travel. Timothy will assist Paul through many of his future missionary journeys. Paul sees Timothy as a son. Timothy will receive two personal letters that we have as a part of our canon from Paul, and Timothy will eventually serve as an elder in the church in Ephesus. The other brother in Acts 19, Erastus, we know less about than Timothy, but we do know from Romans 16, verse 23, and 2 Timothy 4, 20, that Erastus was at one point the treasurer for the city of Corinth, a significant office in the city government. In fact, there is a paved stone east of the theater of Corinth today with an inscription in Latin from Erastus who had donated money to fund the city pavement as an expression of thanks for being appointed as a Corinthian magistrate. And in Acts 19, Erastus is apparently free from the demands of Corinthian public service and was able to freely travel in order to serve alongside Paul and his team in taking the gospel to other cities in the Roman Empire. So we see here, beloved, before we really get into the meat of the text, that God saves all kinds of people from all walks of life. He even saves those who work for the government. (laughs) Praise the Lord. God was using the former Pharisee and persecutor of the church. We can't forget where, where Paul came from. The worst of sinners he would describe as himself. God was using the former Pharisee and persecutor of the church, Paul, to save men and women, married and singles, Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, Romans and non-Romans, and city officials and members of the general public. God delights to save those of high status and low status. He delights in saving the rich of this world and the poor, those who can afford to put a, a, a piece of pavement in a city street and those who beg on that same pavement for food. He loves saving the strong and the weak. 
And remember, beloved, that the gospel, when faithfully proclaimed, will permeate every level of society, calling every person, great and small, to trust Christ, to trust the righteousness that Jesus alone provides, to put your hope not in your own works or your own accomplishments, but to trust solely in the perfect person and work of Jesus, to turn away from the acts and works of sin that once defined you and dominated you, and to run to the servant king who never turns away a repentant sinner who comes to him in sincere faith with a plea for mercy. The same gospel that saved Timothy, saved Erastus, that saved Paul, is the same gospel that we have believed and is saving sinners today. God saved the young, half-Jew, half-Greek man, Timothy, whose faith was a result of the faithfulness of a Christian grandmother and a Christian mom. God saved the Gentile man, Erastus, who at one point was the treasurer of a major Roman imperial city. And in another time, an authoritative magistrate in the city. The Lord saved Paul when he was on his way to arrest Christians and throw them in prison for loving Jesus. So we see here, dream team. The Lord saved these different men from different backgrounds and then saw fit to join them together for the sake of the advance of God's kingdom. Don't see someone as too low or too high for God's salvific reach. The Lord's hand is not shortened. It's not so short that it cannot save. The Lord loves to save governing officials like Erastus. He loves to save half-Jew, half-Greek guys like Timothy who don't seem to fit into any kind of community. And he loves to save people who explicitly hate Jesus and want to harm and persecute his church. No one is outside the scope of eligibility for hearing the gospel. No one is outside of God's saving power. No matter your background, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've run, no matter how much you have despised God and his people, your sin can't overwhelm God's immeasurable grace towards you and mercy in Christ Jesus. Our God is steadfast in his love. That's what he tells us. This is who I am. My love is steadfast. And I am abundant in mercy. He delights to save every kind of unworthy sinner across races, ethnic lines, nationalities, social classes, and family backgrounds. The distinction between those in the New Covenant community and those outside the New Covenant community has nothing to do with how awful your sin or how great your self-righteousness The only inside-outside distinction with regard to the gospel is between those who trust the gospel and those who do not trust the gospel. If you are a sinner, which if you are alive and you are breathing, your brain is functioning, your heart is beating, you're in that category. You're qualified for the gospel, but you must trust Jesus, the King, who calls you to faith and repentance. Your background has no bearing on whether you are in or out. You are in or out solely through faith alone and Christ alone. So today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe the gospel. Run to Jesus. Paul sends Timothy and Erastus ahead of him, but, but Paul stays in the, uh, the Asian city of Ephesus uh, for a little bit longer. He wants to do a little bit more ministry. And Luke, under the inspiration of the Spirit, whether there's someone in this guild who is saved later and then tells him a recollection of the, the conversation, Luke, inspired by the Spirit, gives us an insider's account of the details of the conversation amongst the members of the Ephesian silver or metal guild. So we see Demetrius, a silversmith, Gentile idol maker relays to the rest of the Ephesian Chamber of Commerce the effects of Paul's gospel ministry in the city. Now, important for our context, 
is to understand that central to the city and culture of Ephesus was the Artemis cult. The temple of Artemis was enormous. In fact, the temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It measured one and a half, one and a half times the length of a football field. It was nearly a football field wide, roughly 60 feet tall, consisting of more than 125 Greek columns. The temple of Artemis was four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. Writing about the seven wonders of the ancient world, the second century B.C. Greek poet Antipater of Sidon commented, I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon on which is a road for chariots and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus and the hanging gardens and the colossus of the sun and the huge labor of the high pyramids and the vast tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. And I said, lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. The temple of Artemis and the religious worship of Artemis would have created or influenced numerous sectors of the Ephesian economy. Workers in industries ranging from idol makers to local farmers, butchers, merchants in local markets during their religious festivals, temple prostitutes, among many other different occupations would have all been dependent upon the regular rhythms of the Artemis temple. So put simply, Demetrius tells his fellow fellow idol makers that so many Ephesians are turning away from the Greek gods, particularly Artemis, and turning to Jesus that idol sales have plummeted. Demetrius is like, we've got to pump those numbers up. We've got to get those idol-making numbers back up. Get people worshiping Artemis again. The advance of the gospel has been so powerful, so profound, that Gentiles converting to Christ are producing a major economic impact in the city simply because the demand for idols has radically dropped. Look at verse 25. Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Demetrius argues that this new way, the Christian faith, and it's called a turn from vain idols made with human hands that are not real gods, to love and obey the one triune God who created all things, to trust and to hope exclusively in the incarnate Son of God who died under God's wrath for his people, who rose from the grave in victory and has ascended to the heavenly throne as the sovereign king of all creation, this gospel that Paul was preaching, this new way, is a threefold threat to the city of Ephesus. First, trusting in Jesus Christ threatens the wealth of this guild. From this business, we have our wealth. There is an economic threat produced by the gospel. Second, trusting in Jesus Christ threatens the religion of this city and area. There is a religious threat produced by the gospel. Paul's persuaded many people saying that God's made with hands are not God's. Third, trusting in Jesus threatens to undermine the civic unity of the citizenry of Ephesus, their, their city identity. 
is at stake. There is a patriotic threat produced by the gospel. In almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned people away. The, the, the temple of the great goddess Artemis, what our city is known for, she's going to be deposed. She, whom all Asia and the world worship. The gospel of Jesus Christ threatened the economic, religious, and civic unity of the Ephesian city and culture. And let me tell you, if you threaten either a, a person's wallet or a person's religious commitments or a person's civic identity, you'll typically face some serious pushback. But Paul's preaching of the gospel is threatening all of those things. The gospel of Jesus Christ undermined the Ephesian temple economy, the Ephesian cult worship, and the Ephesian social identity. The gospel was turning the world of the Ephesians upside down. How does Demetrius argue that the Apostle Paul accomplishes this work? Is it Paul going around calling for boycotts? Saints, don't you? Let's boycott them. No more Artemis light. Not online petitions. It's not Paul going to the leaders of Ephesus and saying, listen, we need to have some new legislation. No, the Apostle Paul's preaching of Christ and Him crucified, changing the people of Ephesus, and by transforming the people of Ephesus, changes the culture of the city of Ephesus itself. People, people hear the good news in Ephesus of the one creator God who made people in His image and likeness. And, and, and when Paul says, God made you in his image, that rubs against the idea like, well, what's this little image over here? Oh, this little God. If I'm the image bearer, if I'm made in the likeness of God, this thing's worthless over here. Paul teaches that humans are the image bearers of the one creator God. There's no use for idols and gods made with human hands. This is clear throughout the Old Testament. Paul teaches that God made everyone, but humanity morally rebelled against this God. The one creator God isn't like us. He's not like the Greek gods, tossed to and fro by human passions. God is love. God is just. God is holy. He's perfect. He made us for himself. We deserve his just wrath for our rebellion against him, for our sin. Rather than serving the creator, we worship creatures. And we gave ourselves over to disobedience. But Paul would preach that at the right time, the triune God sent his son. Very God of very God. Who became truly man. Not a demigod like Hercules. But truly man. In every way. Fully God, fully man. This man, Jesus, not, not a metal image fashioned by a silversmith. This Jesus is the true image of God. The incarnate Son of God lived the life of perfect obedience that we should have lived. He died obediently under God's wrath in the place of his people as our substitute. So you don't need those chickens. You don't need those lambs and bulls. You need a Savior. You need a God who will save you himself. And that's what the Lord did. God vindicated his son, raised him on the third day from the grave. Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, and his throne is higher than the throne on Olympus. Zeus and the whole pantheon of Greek gods, they're not gods, and they bow to this king. Offering trivial sacrifices to, to feckless and, and futile false gods who are little more than comic book superheroes won't cause you to escape death or be made right with the God of all creation. God fashioned you with his hands into his image. 
You, you don't serve him by trying to fashion stone or metal or wood with your hands. You, you can't manipulate the Creator like you can try to manipulate Artemis. God can't be contained in the temple. You trust the good news of God's Son. You turn from vain idols to Jesus in repentance. You obey in the power of the Spirit that God Himself supplies. God's kingdom is at hand, Paul preaches. Turn to Christ. And they do in droves. All of Asia. That's what Demetrius is saying. People of Asia, particularly Ephesus, hear this gospel call. Many repent and believe in the good news of Christ Jesus. Ephesians hear this good news preached by Paul. God causes so many of them to be regenerated, to, to be given new hearts and new minds, to be made new creations by the work of the Holy Spirit, applying the work of the Son to their lives. And, and, and these people are radically changed and the entire culture of Ephesus begins to change. So that Demetrius is like, wait, what? Idol sales have dropped 80%. God had freed them from the tyranny of false gods. People with new creation hearts don't want to love or have idols. As citizens change, the city changes. And it wasn't just Ephesus. Pliny the Younger, uh, a Roman civil servant, would write to the Roman emperor Trajan in, in the early 2nd century that the Christian faith had made such inroads into Roman culture that Roman temples had been almost deserted, religious rites were long neglected, and very few purchasers could be found for sacrificial animals. This is a pagan Roman guy writing to a pagan Roman emperor, saying, so many people are becoming Christians that nobody wants to worship you or worship the, the pantheon of Roman gods. And it was, only Roman Christ, or it was only Roman persecution of the Christian faith. It was only torture and death that could slow the advance of the gospel, which is what Pliny the Younger and Trajan began to do. Torturing deaconesses, demanding people to repent of Jesus and to worship the emperor. If you want true, lasting societal change, beloved, our primary task must be to preach the gospel and to pray that God would transform our family members, our friends, our neighbors. In our community. Only when you see the community transformed by the gospel will you see transformation in the culture itself. Pastor Jake prayed for it earlier, praying for righteous laws. And we should pray for those things. But just like he said earlier, we're not under the law. We're under the Spirit. We're under grace. We're in the new covenant. And so God changes us from the inside out and causes us to be generous, more generous than a tithe, tithing law would demand of us. Culture is downstream from theology. So whatever you believe, theology, whatever worldview beliefs you've got, that eventually trickles down into culture. It will inevitably in it will inevitably trickle down. Your belief structure, whatever the belief structure or theology that dominates a society, and every society has a, has a theology. Everybody's a theologian. You don't have to have a PhD to do that. Some of us just did it just because. But that theology, the theology of the masses or the mobs, where the city or the state or the nation will inevitably trickle down and affect, affect community life, politics, and the economy. There are cultures 
This is going to sound possibly arrogant. There are cultures that are superior to others. That, that's a reality. What do I mean by that? Before somebody tweets me incorrectly. Those cultures that have been the most deeply shaped and formed by the gospel of Jesus Christ are those cultures where you see the greatest human flourishing. Cultures where the gospel takes root and blossoms are superior, are more greatly to be desired than those cultures that have been deeply shaped by paganism, naturalism, or false ideologies. How do we know that? Because we're going to have an entire creation, an entire new creation that is dominated by the law of God revealed in Christ Jesus. And that society, that society is going to be perfect. But we see it in part here in this old creation. It was the Christian faith that led to the rise of hospitals. It was the Christian faith that led to the rise of universities. It was the Christian faith that led to greater literacy in Europe and still leads to greater literacy amongst illiterate tribes and cultures today. As the Bible is translated, people learn to read. It was the Christian faith that led to adoption. It was the Christian faith that led to abolition movements in England and the United States, among many other things. Conversely, again, ideas have consequences. Theology informs culture. It, it was atheistic communism that led to the murder of 50 to 100 million people in the 20th century alone. It was atheistic communism that led to the severe persecution of the church in much of Asia. If you want to change the culture, you must transform the people. And that's the responsibility of the church preaching the gospel. If you want to transform the people, you have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and pray to God that he would move and that he would save Part of the reason that our own nation is in such a mess and is what we would call a largely post-Christian society. is because we live in a society that is living contrary to the Christian worldview that informed and undergirded the truths taught and outlined by our founding fathers, our federal and state constitutions, and our Declaration of Independence. That, that's just the reality. The American exper experiment won't last if the, if the culture isn't transformed. Freedom and liberty, fundamental rights, these ideas that come from the Christian faith we're never meant to protect or support transgender ide ideology. Words have meanings in context. Freedom and liberty, fundamental rights, were never meant to protect or support rampant sexual immorality or abortion or any other sort of rebellion against our Creator. Having righteous laws that reflect God's created order and law is fantastic. And we've had it for hundreds of years. But you see in our culture that laws and constitutions and the best governing documents in the history of humanity, other than the Old Covenant, can't restrain the people, can't change the people. No law will change the human heart. Having a brilliant constitution will not be sufficient to sustain a nation or empire which is why Christians are aliens and sojourners in this present world. I love our nation. So thankful to be a citizen here. And I will, I will leverage my citizenship for the sake of the gospel. Because ultimately, our, my citizenship is in heaven. That's where I have a lasting city. Charleston will burn. But the true holy city will, 
and will last forever. Our hope isn't in this old creation, but in the new creation that King Jesus will usher in in its fullness at his return. But in the meantime, as we see here in Acts 19, if you want to see an entire society change, you must first have a massive movement of God's Spirit. Bringing salvation and revival. How? Through saints proclaiming the gospel and sinners repenting and believing. Only when people encounter the living God through the gospel of Jesus Christ will you see cities like Ephesus or Charleston radically transformed. So what must be our aim, beloved? First and foremost, to seek to persuade others to turn to Christ and turn from idols as Paul did in Ephesus. Now, few people in, I, in, in Charleston have little idols, you know, a little silver, silver idol, of, idol of Artemis. It's different here, right? But many people in Charleston are materialistic, so they live and they eat and they sleep in their idols. They drive in their idols. They ride on the creek or the ocean in their idols or whatever. Whatever, whatever idol it is in our city, as Christians, we must be people who are truly distinct from the unbelieving culture around us and present a real alternative to modern, secular, American society in our city. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the alternative. And we must seek to persuade sinners to trust Jesus Christ, who alone can justify sinners, raise the dead, and usher in the new creation. So should we seek social transformation that the gospel produces? Yes. Should we seek to enact righteous laws that reflect God's created order, absolutely. It was Christians in the first century Roman Empire who adopted babies when they were left out to be exposed to the elements. It was Christians who helped end the Atlantic slave trade. It was Christians who helped end infanticide in 19th century India. It was Christians who helped stop the murder of lepers in Asia. It was Christians who helped stop the human sacrifices of various northern and Southern American tribes. It was Christians who helped to overturn 50 years of Roe v. Wade in our own nation. But we must not focus primarily on social initiatives. We must not focus primarily on social initiatives at the expense of gospel proclamation. Gospel proclamation precedes social transformation. Again, should we take opportunities when they arise to enact better laws? Absolutely. But our only hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ to change the people of our particular land. Paul preached and persuaded the word of God continued to increase and prevail mightily. And as more and more people committed to King Jesus, less and less were devoted to Artemis. We must always strive to implement righteous laws, measures in our society that more ref- accurately reflect, more faithfully reflect God's character, his created order, his righteousness, but that will always be secondary to the task of Christian preaching, Christian evangelism, with the aim to convert sinners. Are we praying that our gospel proclamation at Holy City in the Church of Charleston would become so deeply rooted in our city that strip clubs and abortion clinics and mosques and Hindu temples start closing down because the saints of Charleston across all the faithful local churches here are seeing so many conversions that these sin sinners no longer have sufficient business or religious adherence to keep their doors open. If that's what you want to see in the city, preach the gospel. And I pray that the Lord would use our congregation mightily to see many sinners transformed for Christ in Charleston. Let us preach and pray, beloved, and see what our mighty God can do here because he did it in Ephesus. He has already done it in Charleston. And he can do it here again. He can bring revival if he pleases. And we must pray that he will. And then we must 
preach faithfully. All right, so the men of the guild hear the threats to their wallets, the threats to their religion, the threats to their city identity, and a full-fledged riot breaks out. There is mass confusion. There are people that start screaming because they're like, I don't know why I'm shouting, but everyone else is. There is mass confusion. The rioters drag Gaius and Aristarchus, two Greek Christians, who are Paul's companion, into the city's theater. We see from 1 Corinthians 1 that Paul baptized Gaius. We see from Romans 16 that Gaius hosts Paul and an entire congregation in his house. So corporate worship happens at Gaius' house in Corinth. Aristarchus is a Thessalonian Christian who will be with the prisoner Paul as he sets sail for Rome later in the book of Acts. And then Aristarchus will later be imprisoned with Paul as we see in Colossians 4 and the book of Philemon. Gaius and Aristarchus get thrown into the midst of this riot by people who have created a pandemonium. And we see that gospel ministry is is costly. Whether it involves being victims in the midst of a crazy riot, imprisoned for the faith, or hosting an entire congregation in your home for corporate worship, Jesus will demand all of you for all of him. Let us respond to him with yes, Lord. Let us respond to the king. Yes, Lord. Whatever it is that you require. And if that means being faithful in the city and being thrown into a mob for your namesake, yes, Lord. Be with me. Keep me. Let us respond to him with yes, Lord, when he calls us to take up our cross and follow him. Whatever that may look like, because it's going to look different for all of us, and wherever that may lead, the right response is yes, Lord. Humble obedience and faith. These two brothers, Gaius and Aristarchus, and being faithful to Jesus, become victims of the mob while Paul tries to enter the ride in order to say something. Paul wants to go in there and fix it. The saints in Ephesus wisely and rightly restrain Paul. They're like, Paul, everyone in Asia believes because of the Lord's ministry through you. Okay? We got to keep you. We can't let you go in there. We don't know what's going to happen. So they restrain Paul from putting himself in greater danger. The civil leaders, the Asia Arks, we see, they're either Christians themselves or they know and are sympathetic to Paul because he's a Roman citizen. Likewise, keep Paul from entering into the chaos. The Jews put forward Alexander, likely so that the Jews can distinguish themselves from the Christians. Listen, the Christians are the one, they're they're causing the trouble, okay? We're just the Jews, okay? We're in the synagogue, okay? We don't believe in Artemis, but like, we're not leading to the fall and idol sales, okay? That's Paul and and his yoke, his ilk over here. But as soon as, the, as soon as the mob sees that, wait a minute, Alexander's a Jew, they start shouting, drown him out. Hours long chance of Artemis being great. And reading this portion of Acts 19, I mean, it would have been comical to me just reading it like, people are shouting, they don't know why they're shouting, I don't know why I'm angry, but I'm here, and I'm angry, and Artemis is great, yes. Uh, had it not been for like the riots that we saw a few years back in our own cities that destroyed, destroyed cities, led to the deaths of others, recent Hamas protests in, across American college campuses, Antifa causing trouble. Riots can turn exceptionally dangerous rather quickly, and mob riots are possible anywhere. The Ephesian town clerk, very, very high up in the authority structure of the city. He is the one who's essentially interacting with the the Roman imperial proconsuls. The town clerk quiets the crowd by reminding him, listen, 
Rome will not hesitate to come in. If you won't quiet down, they will not hesitate to come in and quiet you down. Any, any riots in the Roman Empire... And the Roman, Roman government will see that as sedition. And they will remove your independence as a city in the Roman Empire. And then you've got military rule in the city. So the town clerk's like, listen, mob rule can't rule. All right? And it certainly can't bring harm to any Roman citizens like Paul. We won't be autonomous anymore. So the city clerk placates the crowd by trying to remind them that everyone knows that Ephesus has been designated as the temple for Artemis. We all know this. The magical stone that fell from the sky, likely a a meteorite or something like that, that they see is like divine in origin falling down. Obviously that came from Artemis. It landed here. No one denies that. Whether the town clerk sees the gospel that Paul proclaims of God's kingdom rightly or not, whether he sees what the way teaches rightly or not, we don't know, but the city clerk rightly states that Christians have not robbed the temple. They haven't done anything sacrilegious to Artemis. They haven't spoken obscenely about Artemis. They haven't disrespected the temple practices. So everybody just needs to calm down. Take it easy. Paul's just persuading people. He's not trying to go in and chop down columns or throw stuff at Artemis. The clerk tells the guild, listen, if you've got a legitimate complaint, take Paul, take the Christians to court where disputes are handled. The Lord sovereignly uses the pagan government to restrain the mob and to protect Paul and the Christians. And we see here that civil government, even unbelieving government, is often a good gift from God to restrain evildoers and can be a great help to Christians who who seek to rightly submit to it and live peaceable lives. Paul regularly used his Roman citizenship or his Jewish heritage as leverage in various places for the sake of the gospel and the church. In the same way that local churches during the COVID lockdown sought to persuade governing officials or or even went to court, took the cities to court, saying we we have a right to, to freely gather. Paul regularly used the Roman legal system in order to protect the rights and existence of local churches throughout the empire. Paul will do anything short of sin for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of Christ. So, the town clerk rightly points people to the Roman courts to adjudicate the issues. The mob disperses. We see in Acts 20, verse 1, Paul takes the opportunity to quickly slip out of the city before any charges can be brought against him or the saints. And Acts 19 closes. So the the mob may have shouted for hours that Artemis was great, but King Jesus showed his superiority to the Greek gods. Why? Because today we're worshiping King Jesus and people are worshiping King Jesus all around the world. And where is Artemis? Few people know of Artemis. So, have a long view of evangelism. Have a long view of gospel transformation. People can shout really loud, be angry in the moment, but the Lord will advance the church. We just keep preaching. We keep proclaiming. Keep sowing gospel seeds. My hope and prayer, beloved, is that the gospel would constantly be on our lips as we regularly seek to persuade unbelievers around us to repent and believe. We must pray that God will transform our city in the same way that he transformed Ephesian society by turning large numbers of sinners into saints through the faithful labors of weak people like us. And we just need to trust the Lord's timing in it. He may not do it for his own wise and good purposes, but we know that he will advance his, his kingdom through the church. That is the promise. And that is the hope. He will save his people so we can preach with confidence. Let us commit ourselves to the task. And may God cause our gospel preaching to be fervent and far-reaching so that many people in Charleston are persuaded to say in faith, great is King Jesus.